Our season continues on Coruscant with two allies of the Sith. With a city of three trillion controlled or at least kept silent in the lower levels, the Sith called this wreckage of the upper level home. Lord Revan and Lord Bane walk side by side, concocting a plan to seize control over the Sith armies so they could bring an end to the reign of the Jedi and establish peace in the galaxy. The two of them were tasked by Axe Raccoon's flagship to locate and find a Jedi who wielded an amethyst blade. They found that it was Master of the Order, Mace Windu, and sent the information back to Exar, and with that, the rest of the Sith. Exar was attempting to call the shots, and without a true leader to take complete control over the entire faction, he was basically the one. The two shadows walked through the halls of the Ripped Apart Temple. There weren't any lights on. All that was revealed was revealed because of the chasm that ripped through half the temple. They were in the Jedi Archives, kinda, and Bane stopped before they left. Revan asked why Bane was stopping, and he suggested that there had to be some more of these Jedi that they could try and find and understand. Revan suggested that besides the Grand Master being killed during the first confrontation, alongside a number of other notable names from this current order, there was nothing to gain from the Archives. Were there? Bane shrugged his shoulders. Maybe there was. They couldn't know until they looked. Revan followed Bane into a hole in the wall, as Bane ignited his crimson lightsaber and examined the room around him. What was Bane looking for? Revan followed quietly until Bane stopped at a broken shelf that belonged to the Archives. He turned his head to Revan and said that there had to be a Jedi that the Order and the Council kept the close eye on. Revan knew there was, but why did that matter? And as he asked the question, he answered it in his own mind. He was that Jedi once upon a time. Bane smiled when he saw the idea click in his head. Bane opened it up and a shattered hologram popped up before his eyes. Bane started searching through as Revan placed himself next to the Sith Lord. The names went on and on, all filled out by various people. Oh fascinating, who was Master Dooku? He seemed to have some sort of issues with the Jedi before leaving some ten years beforehand. He was also a generational talent with the blade. Bane pointed over and told Revan to see if he could find out about this Dooku. The Sith had acolytes fill out information on all the Jedi bodies recovered from the attack. It was important for having a general idea of what had happened to the Jedi forces after their initial assault. They knew how many Jedi died during the attack, and Bane mentioned that he never heard of this Dooku individual. Bane continued a little further, and he saw the name Anakin Skywalker. How peculiar. This one was placed into the archives by Grandmaster Yoda nearly ten years beforehand. What did Yoda have against Skywalker? Revan looked over and told Bane that Dooku was Countess Sereno, but he had since been reported as missing. Revan suggested that he had either died at the Battle of Coruscant or he was hiding because he didn't want to come into contact with the Sith. Revan trusted his instinct and suggested that they not concern themselves with Dooku, especially due to his elder age. Revan then scrolled through the archives to find all the information he could regarding this Anakin Skywalker individual. Revan stumbled back when he found the information regarding the boy. Bane saw Revan stagger back and quickly moved over to his side as they looked on in shock and awe. How was it possible to have so many midichlorians? Bane pulled the hologram off the wall and placed it into his handheld device and accessorized it some more. It didn't seem possible, or even plausible, but it was the truth. He was a 19 year old boy, actually probably 20 at this point, who had a 27,000 midichlorian count? Is it even possible to be that receptive to the force? Revan shook his head. This couldn't be true. It couldn't happen like this, and it certainly didn't seem like the Jedi trusted him. It could be integral to their plans, though. Bane told Revan they could keep it a secret. Revan shook his head, and Bane asked why. Revan believed that if this Anakin Skywalker was what the Jedi considered to be a chosen one, they needed to hunt him. If they could not turn him, then he needed to be killed. They couldn't mess it up. He was likely the key to everything, and if they allowed him to grow, trust within this order, or even grow within the forest itself, then their reign over the galaxy would fall out from under them. Bane shook his head, suggesting that even if this boy could reach his full potential, they could destroy him even if they had to. It wasn't even a competition. Revan didn't believe so, and maybe it made him superstitious, but he believed that some boy could be able to destroy their empire. Bane looked at Revan and said that he trusted him, but they would need to further develop their plans. Revan told Bane that they needed to work quickly. If they didn't, they would sacrifice precious time, allowing other Sith Lords to drown their empire into obsolescence. Revan didn't want that to happen, and neither did Bane. So, it begged the question, what did they do? Revan strategically laid out a plan that could genuinely work. It just required the time and effort to work. He turned to Bane and told him that they make sure everyone was aware of Skywalker. They do not inform everyone that Skywalker was on a short end with the Jedi. They needed to try and turn him to the dark side, but only the two of 
of them. He continued to say that aside from Skywalker, they had to find the Star Forge before any other Sith Lord did. If they controlled it, they controlled the Empire itself. Then they could rule side by side as one united force. Bane suggested that they get themselves allies, and while Revan agreed, these allies were not to know about this plan. As Revan believed, the Sith were far too greedy for their own good. If they informed the other Sith of their plan, the others could try and ruin it. It would be best if they try and create a system of allies that would support them. The main thing was to make sure Exar, or whoever was trying to seize the reins, failed bad enough to make the others resent him or her. Revan and Bane made their way out to the archives and were greeted by Lord Malgus. He looked very disgruntled and he informed them that they were needed inside the flagship of the Empire. They asked why. Malgus gritted his teeth and said that the poor excuse for a Sith Thion returned. Well, isn't this interesting? Bane first asked why he came back. Back. Malgus grinned under his mask and told him that he failed. They asked him where he failed at and Malgus told the two of them that he went to the planet of Tython as a means to strike at the heart of the Jedi. Malgus turned and started walking back to the shuttle. He continued and said that Scion killed a master and apprentice duo, or maybe it was a master and a knight. Regardless, he was there and his army won the battle over a force that was much smaller than their own. It seemed as if the Republic task force led by two Jedi knights snuck in and defeated him, killed his army, and left him for dead. Revan asked for the names, and Malgus snarled out the names of Anakin Skywalker and the Tabre Morden. Revan and Bane looked at each other and followed Malgus into the vessel. Sounds good. Malgus informed them that Darth Treya was returning from her quadrant of the galaxy with Nihilus and Dome. She was reportedly pissed, and she would come and pick up the pieces of Scion. Bane and Revan were amused that she was returning like a pissed off mother. Malgus asked if they found that Exar was looking for, and both of them nodded their heads, telling him that they would be informing the other Sith once they arrived. In the flagship, Scion returned begging for mercy as he currently stood at the feet of Exar Gun. His remaining vessel had returned and he entered the fleet flagship, allowing his personal ship to receive repairs. Exar was annoyed, but no one was really nearly annoyed as Lord Drea. She was out for blood, and because Scion couldn't die, she would make him wish he could. Good. He was in complete control of that, but the pain he was about to go through was something he would not have control of. Exar kicked Sion in the head and turned over to the doors when they opened behind him. He looked at Malgus, Revan, and Bane. None of them seemed to be in high spirits. What a shame. That was something that needed to change. He would be sure to change those feelings within them. They looked down at the Sith Lord before Revan begged the question, asking Exar what happened at Gamor. He hissed, turning his head towards Revan and telling him that his forces got ambushed by the Jedi Master of the Order. Mace Windu was not a Jedi to be trifled with and should be taken as a threat and a number one priority for them and their order to target and kill. If they didn't, he could destroy them and perhaps he would lead a resurgence of the Jedi movement and the movement of the Republic. Revan was questioning of this, asking why he couldn't kill a Jedi Master. Exar told Revan that while he was talented, he was outnumbered when he was engaged by the Jedi Master. Revan wasn't buying it. He said there was a couple of acolytes there with him. If he was outmatched, then why didn't he ask for the names of more Jedi? Exar growled. He didn't like all this questioning, and he told Revan that if he didn't stand down, there would be a problem. Before either of them could go in for each other's throats, Darth Xana walked up to Exar Kun and told him that she believed there was potential victory sitting on the Mandalore system. He turned to her with a glare that could cut through a planet's core as he told her that he didn't want to hear about Mandalore at the moment. Before he could try and rile up Revan more, Lord Lord Treya walked through the doors, surrounded by a couple of her bodyguards with Nihilus quietly shadowing her. He didn't say a word, he just followed her by her side. Treya walked through the center of the room and spoke with an elegant accent that could delight the ears of peasants for eternity. She told the Sith that she was quite sorry for her student's insolence. He must have forgotten his place because there was not a mention of going out and gallivanting around in her studies. She turned to Nihilus for a moment and asked if he had any recollection of going out and acting as such and he shook his head. Treya smiled and turned back to Sion. He looked up pleading that she show him mercy. She laughed quietly, placing her hands together as she looked down at him. Treya asked the other Sith in the room if they showed mercy. Of course not. They were Sith. They were masters of darkness, and failure could only mean one thing. A failure to uphold the ways of the Sith, a failure to the brethren, and a failure to oneself. To do as badly as Scion did was simply frowned upon. She lifted her fingers over him and electricity rained down onto his back as he cried out in agony. The collective Sith watched as lightning rang out a few more times. Sith Lords joined in from various locations around the galaxy over Hologram. They simply looked down and acknowledged that Scion was getting his doom. When she stopped, she turned to all the faces in the Sea of Sith and told them that this is what treachery would bring them. They had experienced failure and they would no longer partake in such failure. The Sith would win. They would always come out on top.
top, and they would remain unbeaten. If they believed anything other than that, then they would be punished. Sion looked up at his master and wished that she stop, and she told him that it was only the beginning of his suffering. He may have failed on Tython, but his failure would be one that would not be forgotten. Chaya moved her hand over so gently, and the guards scurried over to Sion and dragged him out of the room. Nihilus sat himself behind his master as Exar pulled up a hologram. He told them that they needed to find the Star Forge. It was clear there were relics laying around the galaxy, and they needed to find them. Bane pressed a button on his device and a hologram popped up, showing a number of artifacts that Jedi had hidden in their archives regarding the Star Forge. Exar asked if there were more than just those that are previously understood as the only ways to reach it. Bane suggested that it was entirely possible that other cultures hid these artifacts without collaborating with the Jedi. These efforts were a galactic effort to keep the Star Forge hidden. Exar stood up and he told the Collective Council that he would be taking control effective immediately over the Sith Empire. He said that his plan was flawless and they could use it to secure a means to have a victory over not just the galaxy but every other galaxy in the universe. Revan stood out from the crowd. He told Exar that if anyone's taking control over over the Sith Empire, it wouldn't be the Sith Lord who just lost the Battle of Gamor. They could be cutting off supplies to the Republic and heading to Kamino, but since there wasn't a victory, the Jedi were going to fortify that position, which according to the scouts was already true. Exar didn't like this threat to his power, and as the Sith in the room watched with interest, they awaited the next move. Exar pulled his blade from his belt and demanded that Revan stand down. This wasn't meant to be a debate, this was a clear path forward so they could wipe the Republic from the galaxy. Exar used this as a moment to show that Revan, among others, wasn't worthy of ruling over the Sith. That title belonged to those who could unite their cause. They could, under his rule, find the Star Forge and become victorious. Revan ignited his own lightsaber. Exar's double-bladed lightsaber ignited and he prepared to fight off Revan. The two of them engaged in a direct fight on the bridge of the flagship, the two of their blades connecting. The devious dance had everyone on the bridge and on the holograms enamored. Exar used the double-bladed weapon almost like a hypnotic device. He spun it around in a flashy manner to deter each and every single one of Revan's strikes. The Sith all watched in anticipation. It wasn't like they would bow down to the winner, but perhaps they would respect the winner a lot more than they would anyone else. The plan for Exar was to defeat Revan, and crown himself as the leader of their operation. He wouldn't diminish the role of the other Sith because that would only aggravate them. He needed to cultivate their minds. Revan and Exar collided in the middle of the bridge. The screeching of their blades echoed across the chambers and they spun away from each other. The two of them paced around in a circle, their weapons facing each other and their poised position prepared to strike at the other. Exar pushed his offensive and spun his weapon around before disconnecting it and attacking with two separate blades. This forced Revan to ignite another weapon, but before he could, his main one was thrown from his hands as he slipped backwards. At the last second, he was able to ignite the second blade and defend himself, but even by this point it was too late. Revan slid out, but Exar kicked the back of Revan's knee as he moved before sliding his blades around, deigniting one and holding the other around Revan's neck. Exar looked at the rest of the Sith in the ship and told them that it was over. He would take command effective immediately, and that would be all that was needed to be said. The Sith begrudgingly looked around at each other, and then to Revan. Revan patted Exar's wrist, and he was dropped. He wasn't just dropped, he was kicked down to the ground. Revan gritted his teeth. He was just embarrassed. Exar stood up and waved his blade over his head before deconnecting it and telling each of the Sith Lords that he was not their master. He was not trying to control them, rather he was trying to lead them to victory. As the crowd looked on, he told them that he only had one fear. It was a fear of failing them. But that would never happen. They were Sith. They were built upon victory, forged through fire, and their sole purpose was to reign supreme over the galaxy. They would spread out, put the war on the front lines to a slight hold so they could discover the necessary artifacts to win. He continued continue suggesting that each Sith Lord was meant to lead their armies on offensives so they could claim land that could have what they were looking for. Every database in the galaxy needed to be searched. The key to the Star Forge had to be located. They would be victorious if they followed him. He stopped and turned to the other Sith and requested that they inform him of everything they knew so the Collective Council of Lords could be on the lookout. Revan looked up at Bane and nodded his head. Bane told the Council of Lords that he and Revan found something interesting in the database of the Jedi Archives on Coruscant. There was a man named Anakin Skywalker who had a midichlorian count higher than anyone they'd ever seen. He needed to be hunted down and defeated. Exar stumbled back. He asked Bane to repeat that name and he said the name again. Exar looked around the room in a bit of fear. He turned back and told them that Sion was reportedly defeated by Skywalker. Exar exclaimed that the boy was nothing more than that, but he was only beginning to tap into his power. Exar told 
told the Sith that while they were going on their conquests around the galaxy, they had to headhunt a number of Jedi. The most distinguishable were Mace Windu, Anakin Skywalker, and the Tabre Mornin. None of the other Jedi had survived an encounter with a Sith Lord, or Sith of that caliber of Scion, and while his defeat was troubling, they couldn't deny that he was a powerful adversary. If these young Jedi could defeat him seemingly on their own, aside from a Jedi Master who was on Tython, then they were a true problem. The Sith asked if there was anyone else for them to challenge. Exar looked around. His position was a little unsteady. The name of Anakin put a wave of fear through his body. What could he become if he was allowed to develop naturally? This thought made waves through his mind, and it made Exar even more annoyed about the fact that Skywalker was allowed to be given some sort of confidence. Exar suggested that the Jedi should be headhunted, but those three in particular could be utilized. Natabra would be a great tool against a Jedi like Skywalker. Unlike Bane and Revan, Exar had to assume, as every other Sith did, that Anakin was born into the temple and he was loyal to their ways, so instead of trying to convince a Jedi to turn on their brethren, they needed to kill an ally, and that ally was Natabre. Exar wanted to inflict as much pain as he could. Killing the girl would force Anakin into an uncomfortable position, where, as a Jedi, he wouldn't be able to act naturally. He would fall victim to their code and he would likely react out of anger and frustration. If the Sith could capitalize off of that, he would no longer be an issue for them. Before Exar continued, Darth Xana reapproached him to tell him that she believed aside from victory in the Mandalore system, there is a potential artifact relaying some information towards the Starforge present there. Most of the Sith had been afraid to head to Mandalore because of its reputation during their own respective eras, but now it was different. Several Sith had reported what they learned to be that Mandalore had become a rather peaceful planet. After a civil war that nearly destroyed everything, it was clear that they didn't want to actively pursue war. They were riding off the coattails of their predecessors, so the Sith might as well avenge themselves and destroy the Mandalorians, kill their leader, find the artifact, and leave its system in ruins. Exer told Darth Xana to go there. Her enthusiasm for the Mandalore campaign should be enough to garner her a victory in that sector of the galaxy. Exar sent her out and so she quickly scurried off the bridge and prepared her forces for departure for the Mandalore system. Exar turned Darth Malgus and informed him that he'd be leading the second campaign on the Axis of Three. The Sith had a problem in the core and Malgus showed the most resolve through his campaigns. Exar believed that Lord Malgus would be able to go to the planets of Bis, Corellia, and Kuat and take at least one of them. It was a highly defended area and the Republic had an assortment of vessels in that sector that were considered consistently fighting back against the Sith advances. Because of how tight the three systems were, they became an absolute nightmare for the Sith Empire. It was especially an issue because escapees from the other coral worlds fled to the Axis of Three and immediately signed up for military jobs. Whether it be assisting clone troopers or building the vessels they used, it didn't matter. The shipyards at all three planets were at maximum capacity, pumping out warships by the dozen. The issue was having crews to man the vessels. With so many volunteers throughout the three planets, it was easy to get people to fill these ships. But they needed people to maintain control over the operation of those vessels. Republic troopers were moved and spread out throughout the fleet, and they were given the exciting job of teaching civilians how to operate and fire cannons on Venators and so forth. While the Sith were unaware of this, they did know that the Republic fleet's size within the three planets was increasing on the weekly. They needed to attack, and if they didn't, or if they failed, it could be the life support for the Republic forces, if they could at the very least, break to Biss. That was the entry point into the Axis of Three. If the Sith could stop Biss, then it would be incredibly difficult for the Republic to get their reinforcements. Currently, Biss was a hard location to get to because it was surrounded by CIS forces, aside from the entry point at the top of the core. It wouldn't be easy to sneak into Biss, but once they were in, they were in. Exar had two thoughts when it came to an attack at Biss. The first one being that if Malgus could truly succeed in the battle, then they could wipe the Republic naval structure out. With the victory at Biss, Corellia, and Kuat, they could very easily destroy the hopes for the Republic to rebuild their military strength in fleet combat. On the other hand, something that Exar thought would be pretty prudent if Malgus failed is just that. With Malgus defeated and most likely dead, then Exar would have one less Dark Lord of the Sith to worry about. While Darth Vitiate was sitting on the outside of the core, mostly keeping a calm and collected control over the sector, he wasn't the active threat that Malgus was. Yes, Vitiate could be a struggle to deal with, and Exar knew that. However, he was a lot more patient and he wasn't exactly the type of Sith who would just try and kill you immediately. He was a slow burn Sith, whereas Malgus would likely go straight for the execution. Exar's paranoia was a large player in his thought process surrounding those around him. While Magus wasn't exactly fond of Exar's ruling, in the Sith Command, he didn't really care. As long as he was going to win, that's all that mattered. The same could be said for Vitiate. Most of the true Sith Lords were just buying their time until the proper time to strike. If Exar won the rule over them, then that certainly wouldn't be a big deal, because as long as he helped them get to the Starforge, that's all that mattered, realistically. The most important prize in the galaxy was the Starforge. 
On the other hand, Revan got back up and stood next to Bane. Exar could see some sort of bond starting there, and as a means to deter Bane and Revan from collectively forming an alliance, Exar told Revan to take his forces to head to the far side of the galaxy towards the Endor and Sulla systems. Exar intentionally sent Revan there. It was one of the most contentious spaces in the entire galaxy. Not that Endor had the CIS or the Republic clamoring over it, but more or less the Sulla's regions were consistently under barrage from Sith and CIS forces. If he could keep Revan occupied there, then surely he would create a divide between Bane and Revan. That's all that mattered. And while Revan had his apprentice Malik with him, it was a different type of bond. Revan was wise enough to understand that if he wanted a real chance of taking control, he needed an ally that wasn't already tied to him. Malik was already in his corner, and it would seem like the easiest choice to make, which is why Malik would never be privy to these plans. His purpose was to serve as a second in command until Revan or Bane could overthrow Exar. It wasn't like it was the only alliance forming in the ranks of the Sith Empire. The system was very fragile, and if they allowed it to fracture, then they could lose all their progress. Exar gave out a couple more commands to other Sith Lords, and then moved back to his personal flagship. When he arrived, he looked out over his bridge, watching several different fleets disperse into the wider galaxy. Even now, he could feel Scion suffering as his master began to torture him for his disobedience. The dark side was powerful when he fed off of it, not just Scion suffering, but the galaxy full of it. He then thought to himself, it would be a brilliant victory, not to mention how satisfying the destruction of the Jedi would feel. The Sith would reign victorious, and he couldn't help but imagine how he would feel when the time came for him to be heralded in as a Sith King. And that, my friends, is part eight of our story, and special thanks to Galvic Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weebu 670, Anakin Stank Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, Eternal Padawan, Malik, Janin Deguin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kali, Gunling Slayer 66, Mandate Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forda's Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, the Mary Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. I hope you all are enjoying Season 2 so far. Again, check out the Patreon. There are cool updates there. Grand tier, see the episodes a week early, just about. And everyone else gets updates before the episodes come out. Anyways, I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.